Hey everyone, and welcome back to 15 Minute Discourse. Today we're gonna to take a deep dive into something truly revolutionary, fourth generation nuclear reactors. Think of it like this. Remember those clunky old cell phones from the 90s? Oh, I remember those well. Fourth gen reactors are like the leap to the smartphones we have today. Uh, sleeker, more powerful, and capable of so much more. It's a fascinating evolution driven by the need for safer, more sustainable, and efficient energy solutions. Absolutely. These reactors are designed to tackle challenges like climate change and resource scarcity head on. That's exactly right. And leading the charge is the Generation of the Fifth International Forum, or GIF. Yes. They're coordinating global research on these advanced systems, almost like a United Nations for next-gen nuclear power. That's a good way to put it. The GIF has identified six main types of fourth gen reactors, and we're going to explore each one today, highlighting what makes them unique and how they could shape the future of energy. Okay, let's unpack this. First up, we have molten salt reactors, or MSRs. These use molten salt as both fuel and coolant. Right. Can you elaborate on that? Absolutely. What's remarkable about MSRs is that they operate at lower pressures than traditional reactors. Okay. Imagine a pressure cooker versus a regular pot. The lower pressure in an MSR translates to inherent safety advantages. I see. Plus, they can achieve higher temperatures, boosting efficiency, and opening up possibilities for applications beyond electricity generation, like hydrogen production. It almost sounds too good to be true. It does sound very good. Are there any downsides to this technology? Well, like any emerging technology, MSRs have their challenges. Sure. One is the corrosive nature of the molten salt, which requires specialized materials and careful management. Another is the changing chemical composition of the salt due to neutron bombardment, which researchers are actively working to address. Interesting. So it's not a perfect solution, yeah. but it definitely has the potential to be a game changer. I think that's a fair assessment. What's next on our list? Next, we have gas-cooled fast reactors, or GFRs. They utilize helium gas as a coolant, which is inert and doesn't become radioactive. So inherently safer than water-cooled reactors. That's right. The Allegra demonstration project in Europe is aiming to prove the viability of GFR technology, qualifying key components, and testing a closed cycle gas turbine for energy conversion. This turbine could achieve impressive efficiencies of around 48%, significantly higher than what we see in conventional nuclear plants. 48%, that's a huge jump in efficiency. What about the materials used in these reactors? Are they any different? Yes, they are. GFRs often utilize silicon carbide as a cladding material, which can withstand the extreme heat generated within the reactor core. Okay. This material is incredibly durable and resistant to damage, further enhancing safety and longevity. Wow, GFRs sound incredibly promising. Okay, now for something completely different. Let's talk about lead-cooled fast reactors, or LFRs. Okay. Molten lead as a coolant. That sounds uh, a bit unconventional. It might sound unusual, but lead has some unique properties that make it very suitable for this application. Like what? For one, it has very low neutron absorption, which allows the neutrons to maintain a high energy level or fast spectrum. Okay. This fast spectrum is crucial for breeding new fuel and even burning up existing nuclear waste, something other reactor types struggle with. So LFRs could help us deal with the nuclear waste problem. That's the idea. That's fantastic. But like with MSRs, there are challenges. Of course. Corrosion and erosion are major concerns in LFR systems due to the high temperatures and the corrosive nature of lead. Yeah, I can imagine. Researchers are exploring mitigation strategies, such as carefully controlling oxygen levels and developing new, more resistant alloys. It seems like every step forward in nuclear technology comes with new challenges. That's often the case, yes. But it's encouraging to know that scientists are constantly working on solutions. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned that LFRs are being developed around the world. Can you give us some specific examples? Certainly. Meroa in Belgium is a 100 megawatt thermal reactor designed to transmute nuclear waste. That's incredible. Russia is developing the SVBR-100, a modular 100-megawatt electric reactor design, and the Brest Odo 300, a 300-megawatt electric reactor designed with enhanced proliferation resistance. So different countries are pursuing different applications for this technology. Exactly. The global interest in LFRs demonstrates the versatility and potential of this reactor type. It's not a one-size-fits-all solution, but rather a platform that can be adapted to meet various energy needs. Okay, that's three down, three to go. I'm already seeing a pattern here. Each of these reactor types uses a unique coolant and fuel combination, leading to distinct advantages and challenges. That's a keen observation. Let's move on to the next one. What's up next? Next on our list is sodium-cooled fast reactors, or SFRs. 
Like LFRs, they operate with a fast neutron spectrum, but they utilize liquid sodium as their coolant. So fast neutrons are the key to unlocking new possibilities in nuclear energy. In many ways, yes. SFRs, with their ability to efficiently fission plutonium isotopes, can significantly reduce waste streams and maximize energy output from nuclear fuel. Plus, they have impressive safety features, such as long thermal response times, large margins to coolant boiling, and an intermediate sodium system for added protection. Multiple layers of safety, that's reassuring. Very much so. Are any countries currently working on SFRs? Several countries are heavily invested in SFR development. Such as? Japan has a strategic roadmap to build next-generation SFRs within existing power plant sites. Wow. Korea is developing a prototype generation, AVI SFR, and a smaller, modular version called SALUS. Interesting. And here in the U.S., TerraPower is spearheading the natrium demonstration plant in Wyoming, which will feature a unique molten salt energy storage system. It's fascinating to see how different countries are approaching the development of these advanced reactors. It really highlights the global nature of this technological pursuit. For sure. Okay, we've covered four reactor types so far. What's next? Next up, we have supercritical water-cooled reactors, or SCWRs. Supercritical water. That sounds intriguing. What exactly is that? Supercritical water exists in a state that's neither liquid nor gas, but possesses properties of both. Oh, okay. SCWRs use this unique fluid to achieve exceptionally high thermal efficiencies, potentially exceeding 45%, surpassing even the efficiencies of GFRs. Wow, that's impressive. But with such extreme conditions, there must be some serious challenges, right? You're right. The high operating temperatures in SCWRs present significant challenges for material durability and safety. Researchers are focusing on developing new materials and designs that can withstand these extreme conditions. But the potential rewards in terms of efficiency and performance are so great that 32 organizations in 13 countries are actively researching this technology. That speaks volumes about the global interest in pushing the boundaries of nuclear energy. It does. It seems like the potential benefits outweigh the risks for many researchers. It would seem so. All right, we've got one more reactor type to cover. What's last on our list? Last but certainly not least, we have very high temperature reactors, or VHTRs. The name itself suggests some serious heat. What's special about these reactors? VHTRs, like GFRs, utilize helium as a coolant. Okay. But they also feature a unique fuel type called triso-coated particle fuel. Mm. This fuel is designed for inherent safety and can withstand extremely high temperatures, even hotter than SCWRs. So we're talking about incredibly efficient power generation here. Exactly. VHTRs can achieve efficiencies of up to 48% and are particularly well suited for industrial process heat, especially for producing hydrogen, a clean burning fuel that can play a significant role in decarbonizing various sectors. And I bet there's some exciting VHTR projects in development as well. Absolutely. Global First Power is collaborating with USNC in Canada to build a demonstration micromodular reactor plant using VHTR technology. Here in the US, X Energy is deploying its X100 reactor in Texas and has partnered with Energy Northwest to build up to 12 reactors in Washington state. And Kairos Power is constructing its Hermes reactor in Tennessee, which holds the distinction of being the first generation the Thief reactor to receive an approved construction permit from the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. That's an incredible amount of progress. It's amazing to see these advanced nuclear technologies moving from concept to reality. It is exciting. We've covered six entirely different types of fourth-gen reactors, each with its own unique characteristics, advantages, and challenges. We have... What a journey. It's truly a diverse and dynamic field, brimming with potential. It is. But it's important to remember that bringing these reactors to widespread deployment involves more than just technological innovation. We also need to address the economic hurdles and public perceptions surrounding nuclear power. That's a crucial point. Even with all these amazing advancements, public acceptance and financial feasibility are key factors in determining the future of fourth-gen reactors. Well, I agree. Okay, well, this has been a really fascinating overview of these groundbreaking technologies. Yes, it has. Now let's get down to brass tacks. Okay. What's standing in the way of these reactors revolutionizing our energy landscape? That's a crucial question. While these technologies hold immense promise, widespread adoption faces some real-world hurdles. Such as? One of the biggest challenges is economic. Okay. Developing, testing, licensing, and constructing these new reactor designs require substantial investment. It's not just about building a better reactor. It's about creating a whole new energy infrastructure. 
Precisely. Right. And that can be a tough sell. Yeah. Especially when competing against established energy sources, governments, investors, and ultimately the public need to be convinced that fourth gen reactors are a worthwhile long term investment. Which brings us to the elephant in the room public perception. Yes. Despite advancements in safety and waste management, nuclear power still carries a certain stigma. Understandably so. How do we change that narrative? It's a challenge, but not an insurmountable one. Transparency is key. The nuclear industry needs to be open about the risks and benefits and communicate clearly with the public. We need to move beyond the fear mongering and focus on evidence based information. So it's about building trust and showing people that fourth gen reactors are a safe, reliable part of our energy future. But isn't it more than just communication? Don't these reactors have inherent safety features that address past concerns? Absolutely. Many fourth-gen reactors incorporate passive safety systems that rely on natural forces like gravity and convection to shut down the reactor in case of an emergency. This means no need for human intervention or external power sources, a huge improvement over previous generations. So they're designed to fail safe. That's the idea. That's a powerful argument for safety. I agree. What about the waste issue? That's always been a major concern with nuclear power. Rightfully so. Yeah. But here's where fourth gen reactors offer significant advantages. Some, particularly those with closed fuel cycles, generate significantly less radioactive waste. And the waste they do produce is far less long lived compared to conventional reactors. So we're talking about reducing the time scale of radioactive waste management from millennia to centuries. Exactly. Mm. It's a dramatic improvement that directly addresses one of the most persistent criticisms of nuclear power. OK, so we have safer reactors, less waste and potentially huge environmental benefits. We do. But let's be realistic. How long will it take for these reactors to make a tangible impact? Predicting precise timelines is tricky. Sure. It depends on the specific reactor type, the pace of development and licensing in different countries, and of course, public acceptance. So some types might be commercially viable sooner than others. Yes. Smaller modular reactors, or SMRs, could be deployed within the next decade, offering a more flexible and scalable approach. Others, like molten salt reactors, might require more time for research and development. But even if it takes a bit longer, the potential rewards seem worth the wait. They do. We're talking about addressing climate change, achieving energy independence, and creating a cleaner, more sustainable world. Absolutely. It's exciting. Fourth gen reactors represent a paradigm shift in nuclear energy. And while there are challenges to overcome, the future looks incredibly bright. I'm feeling optimistic. It feels like we're on the cusp of a new era in nuclear energy. It does. One that's safer, cleaner, and more efficient than ever before. For sure. But even with all this potential, what can our listeners do to stay informed and be a part of this conversation? That's a great question. I think the most important thing is to stay curious. Learn as much as you can about these technologies. Understand the science and engage in thoughtful discussions. Right. Don't let fear or misinformation cloud your judgment. Good advice. The future of energy is something that affects us all, and we all have a role to play. Now let's shift gears a bit and dive into the specifics of each reactor type, starting with molten salt reactors. Okay. What makes them so unique, and why are researchers so excited about their potential? Molten salt reactors, or MSRs, are fascinating for several reasons. Okay. They operate at lower pressures and higher temperatures than traditional reactors, which leads to a number of advantages. Right. The lower pressure enhances inherent safety, while the higher temperatures increase efficiency and open up possibilities for non-electric applications like hydrogen production. So MSRs are not just about generating electricity. They could play a role in producing clean fuels as well. Precisely. That's amazing. And the use of molten salt as both fuel and coolant allows for a continuous refueling process, unlike traditional reactors that require periodic shutdowns for refueling. Okay. This continuous operation makes MSRs more efficient and reduces downtime. That's a big advantage. It is. But you mentioned earlier that MSRs also face challenges. Go over those. One of the main challenges is the corrosive nature of the molten salt. Okay. It requires specialized materials and careful management to prevent corrosion and ensure the reactor's long-term operation. Another challenge is the changing chemical composition of the salt due to neutron bombardment. Right. This can affect the reactor's performance and requires sophisticated monitoring and control systems. 
So it's not a simple plug and play technology. Not quite. There's a lot of ongoing research and development needed to overcome these hurdles. There is. But it sounds like the potential benefits are significant enough to warrant the effort. I believe so. Now let's move on to gas-cooled fast reactors, or GFRs. What sets them apart from the other reactor types? GFRs utilize helium gas as a coolant, which offers several advantages. Helium is inert, meaning it doesn't react with other materials in the reactor, and it doesn't become radioactive when exposed to neutrons. Huh? This makes GFRs inherently safer than water-cooled reactors, where the coolant can become radioactive and pose a risk. So safety is a major selling point for GFRs. What about their efficiency? How do they compare to other reactor types? GFRs can achieve impressive thermal efficiencies, exceeding 45% in some designs. Wow. This is due in part to the use of a closed cycle gas turbine for energy conversion, a highly efficient technology that's well suited for high temperature applications. Higher efficiency means less fuel consumption and less waste generation. That's a win-win for both the environment and economics. I agree. Now, you mentioned earlier that GFRs use some unique materials in their construction. Can you elaborate on that? GFRs often utilize silicon carbide as a cladding material for the fuel rods. Okay. Silicon carbide is incredibly durable, resistant to high temperatures, and radiation damage. This material contributes to the reactor's safety and longevity, reducing the risk of fuel rod failures and extending the reactor's operational lifespan. It sounds like GFRs are designed with both safety and efficiency in mind. They are. It's pretty remarkable how these advanced reactors address many of the concerns surrounding traditional nuclear power, paving the way for a cleaner and more sustainable energy future. Yeah, it really does feel like we're witnessing a nuclear renaissance, uh, a new chapter in the story of this powerful technology. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. But this isn't just a story of technological innovation. It's also a story of human ingenuity and collaboration. Absolutely. And the best part is this story is still being written. You know, we've discussed several projects already underway, but countless more are on the horizon. Right. Researchers around the globe are pushing the boundaries of what's possible, constantly innovating and refining these designs. It's like watching a technological revolution unfold in real time, a revolution with the potential to reshape our world for the better. But as with any revolution, there will be challenges along the way. True. We can't just focus on the technical aspects. It's we also need to address the economic realities and the need for public acceptance. Developing and deploying these advanced reactors requires significant investment, and we need to ensure they're economically competitive with other energy sources. And that's where public perception comes in. Yeah. Despite the incredible safety advancements in fourth gen reactors, we need to overcome the lingering stigma associated with nuclear power. That's right. Transparency and open dialogue are crucial. Mm. We need to clearly communicate the benefits of these technologies, address concerns head on, and foster a sense of trust and understanding. So it's about educating the public, dispelling myths, and highlighting the incredible potential of fourth gen reactors to address some of our most pressing global challenges. Exactly. If we can successfully navigate these challenges, the rewards are immense. Imagine a world powered by clean, safe, and sustainable nuclear energy, a world free from the constraints of fossil fuels and their environmental consequences. That's a future worth striving for. And it's a future that's within our reach if we work together to make it happen. I agree. Well, this has been an incredible deep dive into the world of fourth gen nuclear reactors. Yeah, it has. It's clear that these technologies represent a major step forward in nuclear energy, offering safer, cleaner, and more efficient solutions for our energy needs. They really do. I'm truly excited to see how this technology develops in the years to come. Me too. It's a fascinating field. And that brings us to the end of today's deep dive. Thank you so much for joining us, and we encourage you to continue exploring this incredible technology and the potential it holds for our future. It's been a pleasure talking about this. And to all our listeners out there, if you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe to 15-Minute Discourse for more in-depth discussions. Until next time, keep those minds curious.